welcome. I'm Jane Treger. This is Talking Art, and we're sitting in the Deerfield Arts Bank. It's closed in August, but it's filled with Louise Minx's art. And Louise is here herself, and Louise is the one we're going to interview today. Hi, Jane. <laughs> Hi, Louise. <laughs> we have such bright, beautiful things here, and there's so much to talk about. So let's go quickly through what I like to ask right away, sure. which is, if you're not local, where do you come from and what brought you to this area? I originally came from Indiana, that's where I grew up, and my husband and I went to school there, and then he had a chance to come here for graduate work. So we moved to Massachusetts, and we're both history nuts, so uh, we loved Massachusetts and decided to move here. We've been here ever since, since 1970. Are you telling me there's no in history in Indiana? Not a lot. <laughs> They don't save it the way they do in Massachusetts. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Right. Well, um, with that, uh, it, oh, in terms of art, mm -hmm. were you trained as an artist or did you just accidentally come upon it? How did... That's always a, a fun question to answer because no, I was not trained as an artist. My parents were very, very encouraging. I loved art. I always did artwork as a child, but we had no art in my elementary school. When I was in high school, I played in the band, so I couldn't take art because we only had one choice. When I went to college, I was taking required subjects. I did not give myself permission to take art. So I've never had art training as, as such. But my training came through two things, three really wonderful professionals that I took workshops with, and then good art friends. And by working with them, I learned so much. And that's really how I evolved. Didn't you have an early art teacher? Oh. <laughs> that wonderful experience. Thank you for reminding me. I did have one teacher for, um, gosh, I think it was a year. My parents did hire a, a local art teacher to come on Saturday mornings to our house. And there were in neighborhood kids, and we sat around the ping pong table, and she gave us art lessons. Thank you, because that was... That's important. It was critical. I still hear her voice in my head. I see her face. Um, I remember her name. What's her name? Deanie Perry. I just... Thank you, Deanie Perry. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. I mean, really, it is priceless. Thank you for but reminding me. But I think me. it's... Thank you for your parents. Yes, that's, yes. I mean, how many parents yes. do that for their children when they see that's that right. there's a need... Right. And, and, and to meet it yeah. when the school system doesn't. Yeah, right. That's thank you. Good, good. Yeah, thank you for them, too. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then what I heard is really quite wonderful. It means that you really are in touch and willing. There's a humility that allows you to be a learner mm. from your friends. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I am still learning so much. My friends are the best role model for me. They keep growing and changing, and they inspire me. And I have said this to them, and they're very embarrassed when I say it, but it's really true. It's really uh -huh. true. It's, well, I'm it's sure special. The, I'm sure the feeling is mutual, by well, the way. Well, I hope. <laughs> yeah. I never know. Well, there's a, there's a quality about you that is uh, not just the interest in history, but the, mm. that is the teacher. Mm. That's right. And so let's start with the two first pieces that we're going to look at because they are instructional as well mm -hmm. as art. That's yes? right. That's right. So this enormous panel that looks mm -hmm. like it's on leather but, or mm -hmm. suede, but it, is that really suede? It's meant to look like um, skins of animals, yes. Uh -huh. So it was based on the hide paintings that Native American people used. And then when the Spanish came in as colonial conquerors, they used them as well. So this is quite large, and you told mm -hmm. me that this is part of a series. Right. And you take this to schools and museums and all kinds of places. So what are you teaching with this piece? The story is the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which most people don't even know about, never heard of. I haven't. But that's it. <laughs> New Englanders think they have all the history there is to know about America. You know, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid they do. And being a Midwesterner, I know that's not true. But this is such an important piece of American history because it was the only time that Native people were successful against the European invaders. So, so this whole series, of which mm -hmm. we have only one here, right. illustrates this. That's right. That's and right. What in, in how many pieces in the series? There are ten. <coughs> and this is number what? This is number one. <coughs> and, and it's about the creation as Pueblo people saw it, so it's their version of creation. And then each part of the series is either a native interpretation of the time period 
or Spanish interpretation. So that's how the paintings are designed. Uh huh. This is the piece we had in Landscapes, yes? That's right. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. And it was at the Jones Library last the winter. The whole series? The whole series. I was artist in residence at the Jones Library in 2014. And so these are canvas that are attached to this fake suede. It has suede borders, um, edges, yes. but yeah. otherwise it's canvas. And, right. it's, and it's acrylics? That's right. Acrylics on canvas? Right. And we're not used to seeing canvas that's not framed. That's right, yeah. And it's okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I loved it. And one thing was that the original Hyde paintings were not framed. They weren't stretched. They were just hung. And Europeans, of course, wanted everything very regular. So they would trim them up and sew them to make them rectangular, whereas native people left the feet on the necks and the heads, and, and it, they were very irregular. But they were not, not stretched, not framed. Yours are regular. Mine are very European. <laughs> But it was also canvas, so I didn't have to worry about the arms and legs. Of the animal. Right. <laughs> or you didn't have to worry about the animal. Right. <clears throat> well, this other piece over here, which looks like a short screen. Yes. Right. Tell us about that. This is another mm -hmm. one of these educational pieces. That's right. When I was artist in residence at Harper's Ferry, which was really, really exciting, you had to propose a project. And the same with the Pueblo Revolt series. That was a project for the Wurlitzer Foundation. So this was for Harper's Ferry. And I said that I would do something on African-American participation in the Civil War. And I did two of them. I did one on the Underground Railroad, which is this one that, that you have here. And then I did one on just a little bit of the history of Harper's Ferry. So we have four panels here. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us? what the four scenes are? Sure. And they're designed to sit on a tabletop. That's the educational part. They would collapse, go into a box easily, could be delivered to a school or to a library. So what is the medium? It's on paper, right? It's silkscreen. It's, they're silkscreen oh. monotypes on paper. And I made two copies. They're not the kind, it's not the kind of silk screen where you can get multiples. You have to ink well, it. Well, monotype is one. That's right. That's, thank you. <laughs> and so I had to do it twice. But I did one for me. And but it's not a duo story. No. It's still a monotype. It's still a monotype. Another, That's right. Because tell us how yeah. monotypes are made. Well, these kind are made by drawing on a screen with ink. And what do you mean place, by a screen? Uh, the silk screen sits above the paper and you draw with ink or paint with ink on the silk screen, then you lower it down to the paper and with a squeegee, which is a flat rubber blade, you pull the ink through the screen and that makes one print. It doesn't smoosh out in different directions? It's amazing. It's, it just it's goes exactly where exactly it is. Exactly where you put it, yeah. And it's interesting because the first place where you put the ink, that's the part that will print. So other colors will slide right over the top if they find a little empty space, they will print on the empty space. But where you put the ink is what will print. It's a miracle. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a little hard to explain. So, so how many, <laughs> let's take for instance, um, well let's take the ship one. Yes. Uh, how many screens? screens are you going through? Because of this process, it's just one screen. So you paint the ship, That's the, right. everything, everything I see there everything. is on the screen. That's right. And that's then you right. lower the screen to the paper. Right. And you, you do your squeegee. Right. And, and it stays it. in place. It that's doesn't right. go squishing off in a different no. direction. No. It's amazing. Yeah. And then I do touch it up. I go over the top, like the first image there, breaking the chains, which is my favorite image, which is about breaking the chains of slavery. Uh, I did touch it up because I couldn't get the fine lines to work originally. So you get the big color masses, and then you can go over the top with a brush and so, ink, uh -huh. and you can touch it up, right? It's a little more detail. Uh -huh. That was a shirt, by the way. We printed that on a shirt for Greenfield. Greenfield did an Underground Railroad program a few years ago, and we printed those on shirts. And so we have a lot of shirts that were sold with that image. Well, I like the last two images perhaps Good. most. Not it has nothing to do with the storyline. It yeah. has to do with just the aesthetics of the color. Yeah. Tell me what's happening in the, with the man with the boat. The man with the boat is trying to the, cross the, the, the little canoe. That's right, or a rowboat. A he's rowboat. crossing the Ohio River, and he's following the North Star, which is in the sky. And uh, Frederick Douglass named his publication North Star. And of course, the North Star was what you would follow to get north and also all the way into Canada. So he's crossing the Ohio at night.
And the last scene looks quite like Boston. The last scene is a combination of images. Uh, the one on the left, the far upper left with those big circular windows, that was the the center of the Underground Railroad in Boston. And that is now a museum of the Underground Railroad. It's quite wonderful. What was the building I'm then? trying to remember now. It was a school, I believe. That's quite a school it building. It was quite a school building. Yes, it was. It was two stories. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can do that as part of the uh, African American walking tour in Boston. I recognize the gas lamps and Beacon That's Hill. right. That's right. And, and the three other buildings, one of them was in Vermont, which was near the Canadian border, very special place that's now a museum also. One is an alleyway. You can see the alleyway going back to a little door. That was in Minnesota. So all different places, and one was in Ohio. So you have a composite. Yeah, you have four different locations represented as so you part still, of it. So you still go to schools with this? And yes, yes. That's, yeah, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, it's very exciting. It's very, very Do exciting. the children appreciate this? They do. They do, and they love to hear the story, and they love to see what they can see, and I ask them questions. You know, what do you see here, and what do you think he's doing? And, you know, like the, man, the men on the boat, lots and lots of slaves escaped by sea because it was one of the easiest ways from the seaports to get up to Newport or New Bedford or Philadelphia. Yep. Well, okay, so now let's move on to the rest of this group here. Okay. I see two, two styles, not two styles, I see two topics. Okay. One is landscapes mm -hmm. and the other is trucks. Trucks and cars. That's right. Trucks and cars. You want to talk about <laughs> trucks and cars? Sure. You just I, don't look like a truck and car person. Oh, I am. <laughs> and the more beat up, the better. It, it, it needs to be beat up. Those all kind of finished and you know restored kind. They don't interest me very much. Um, it's it's a series called Transportation Blues. I've been doing it for years. I keep adding to it. So what you're seeing here behind me, Texaco truck. That's relatively new. That's um, a Vermont scene. But I have some from. Do a you lot work of, from photographs? I do, but I also do things on site. I, I do a lot of painting on site. So this on one site. here? It was this was a photograph, right. Uh -huh. And it's in Vermont. And, and uh, the one with the hollyhocks? What is Holly, that? The hollyhocks is an, another series I called Cars, Trucks, and Flowers. And that was really a fun challenge to myself because we, th we think of flowers as little, cars and trucks as big. So well, you change let's the scale. reverse it. Yeah, let's reverse it and put the delicate, fragile things that we think of as flowers. Let's make them big and powerful. And then the sturdy well, cars and trucks make them little. Well, at first I thought that you were just sitting, hiding behind the hollyhocks, right. looking at this <laughs> truck over slightly in, you know, in the driveway over there. But right. then I noticed that the part of the truck is in front of one of the hollyhock flowers. Right. So that was confusing. I think now I don't really know where I am. That's right. <laughs> That's so part the of the truck, fun. The truck is just sort of floating. That's right. It's part of the fun. It's part of the fun. Okay. Yeah. This is not real. No, and it's just inserting the two together and trying to make a composition that's exciting and fun and interesting and different and different. It attracts your attention for the reasons you just said because it doesn't really make any sense. Right. I, I would have been just as happy with the hollyhocks in the front. That would have worked for me too. <laughs> and then when I saw that the back wheel is in yeah. front of a hollyhock, right. I thought, oh, wait a second. I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, the perspective is yeah. is like not working here. Yeah. Uh huh. The one to the left of that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Th yeah. These are, by the way, all acrylics. Yes. That's right. I'm. I'm. I'm Why do you like acrylics? Oh, I'm a fan. I am Why? such a fan. I used to be an oil painter, and all my portraits are oil paintings. But um, acrylics are portable. They're non-toxic. They're flexible. They uh, don't yellow and age and crack like oils. Um, golden acrylics, they've done all these extensive series of um, testing and all kinds of stuff. I don't know stuff. what golden acrylics are. Golden is the company. Oh, and, I see. And they're the one, sort of the, one of the forerunners of creating and developing acrylics. So now I've moved from traditional acrylics, which most oil painters always say dries too fast and doesn't have the qualities they're looking for. I loved the fact that it dried fast. I like to paint on site and I love putting a dry painting in the car. I just <laughs> love that. Wow, there's I a practical lady. I, I love that. But they also, they have a new paint called open acrylics which dries much slower so it works more like oils. So now I've shifted completely to open acrylics. Open? Open acrylics and golden is the sort of forerunner. More and more of the brands are using what they call open acrylics now. Yeah. I'm thinking of how they marketed that. I'm thinking 
Well, it's slow. Yeah, but we can't call them slow. That's occurs. right. That's exactly well, right. Well, what's the other word we right. can use? <laughs> right. Open. Okay, open. <laughs> right. <laughs> Got but they're basically, it's slower quilts. It's slower, but yet Slow it drying. still basically dries overnight. Uh -huh. So during the day, while you're working and blending and maybe want softer edges, you can get them really easily now. Otherwise, you have to work very, very fast. But yes. I work fast anyway. But this, this is really works for me. Okay, the hollyhocks yeah. in the truck don't mm -hmm. look like you work fast. But, but the, the truck on the, on the left there, mm -hmm. that looks a little faster to me. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? The interior? Yes, yeah. this interior of this wreck of a truck. Right. Well, I, I owe this image to Chris Curtis, who's a photographer, and he and I did a show together of his old truck and car photos and my paintings. Wonderful. Uh, it was I wish wonderful. I'd done that show. I, <laughs> it was wonderful. And so I took several of his and painted from his photos, and this is one of them. And it looks faster mostly because there's not quite as much drawing in it as it was in the flower and trucks painting. But actually, I do, I work fast. I work fast. So I think what I like particularly is this really strong contrast of red and green, mm. which are the opposite colors of mm. the the color wheel mm -hmm. so they just it just pops out yes yes and then sort of like then there's this other scene which are the trees behind mm -hmm. which are these purple and greens and then down in the bottom where the mm. petals are mm. is like purple and green mm -hmm. down there mm -hmm. too this is um and you can feel the sunlight coming right in and creating that shadow of the steering wheel on the door Sunlight and Shadow, that's the title of the painting. And that's, that's the title of the painting. That's the t and that's what attracted me, was the, was the shadow on the door. That's what was exciting. And then the green, the touches of green on the windows, that's me. That's Louise saying, I think it'd be really fun to put a really intense color right here. Right there. And right here. And I do that more and more. That's a piece of me now that's developing further and further in my work. Also very fast. What, what is this uh, water scene called? That's ocean Sunset. Yeah. Okay, Ocean mm -hmm. Sunset. I could have guessed that. You could have. Yes. You could have titled that. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and is this one called Hollyhocks and Trucks? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's pretty basic. Okay. Let's see how good I get at this. Okay, so tell us about this uh, sunset scene here. Well, I, I've been showing um, on Martha's Vineyard for a while in a gallery, and um, she really wants images that are local to the Cape and the islands. So th this was a photograph taken by a friend and I looked at it and immediately I said, I could work from that photo. Were those the colors? They were, they were, they were. And they it, were. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't work from photographs that I don't feel translate into paintings well for me. But this one really did. So this is the second version. There was a larger version that was two feet by four feet. And what, that was really is, wonderful. Is, oh, this four is, feet, yes. This is more like 18 by 40, yes. something like that. Mm -hmm. But the two feet by four feet, that one has sold wonderfully. And, uh, and I just love the you image. Can do, you can easily do two versions of the mm -hmm. same thing. Very easily, very easily. It doesn't, does it f feel repetitive? No, no. Why not? I, I don't, there's something about scale. And, and, and everyone's a little different, you know, everyone's, you know, there's a little bit of emphasis more here and a little bit there. And you look at the first painting and you say, oh, I really like that, but, you know, it'd be fun to do this or that. Well, so can so, you tell us, we don't have them both here, right, can you tell right. us what you changed? I'm not sure in this one, to tell you the truth, it's been around for a while. So uh -huh. I'm not sure I would remember. It, maybe I may have intensified the pinks a little. Sometimes I'll move the sunset over a little. I say, well, I'd like a little bit more off center. You know? Oh. I would do that, sure. Sure. Or change the foreground. Bring the water down a little further. Or the rocks up a little further. In other words, the picture has that, but you chose to cut it out before. Or add. Or you or add, add something add. that's not in the picture. Oh, sure. Oh, oh sure. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so those, some of those rocks may be fake. They may be totally fake. Invented, brought in from elsewhere. You know how we look at sky sometimes yeah. and we say, if I painted that, no one would believe it. Oh, it's true. But this is a believable sky. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought the whole thing was believable, and that's one reason I was willing to try it. And I love it. I just loved it. I love it too. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Smaller, but in the same mm -hmm. proportions, mm -hmm. is, let me see if I can get a good title for that one. You might not guess this one. Okay, I won't try. <laughs> Go ahead, tell this me. This one's Autumn Reds. No, I would not have guessed yeah. that one. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Is this local? Very local, it's just down the street from me, and it's the result of a day in October, about two years ago, 
I was so frantic to paint because, you know, the, the colors just zoom by, zoom. And I was so frantic to paint that I said, tomorrow I will paint. I don't care where it is or, or what, I'm going to be out there painting. So I did three paintings that day. And this is one of them just up the road. And it's very loose, as you notice. It's extremely loose, which I love. But it's very, very loose and, and I hope really fresh. That's my goal. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's absolutely beautiful. It's just a fun stone wall, a nifty house behind where the, the colors of the trees blend with the house. Yes, And indeed. then the red bushes are those, um, uh, they're, they're very intense red, I forget what they're called now, but in the, in the autumn. Burning bushes? Maybe that's it. Maybe it's elements of the burning bush in with that stone wall. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, um, let's, let's see, we've talked about about the truck that's behind you, the Texaco truck, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that was at the same time as these. And, but we haven't talked about the one that's behind me. Can you mm -hmm. tell me about that one? Sure. Let I'm, me guess the name of that one. Oh, good. <laughs> this one you can do. <clears throat> the Montague Mill? Good job. Oh. Good job. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and I wanted to be sure and bring that painting because that's where I've worked and had a, a gallery and now I'm part of a cooperative there. So I've been there almost 20 years. It's just down the road from me. It's 10 minutes from my house. Uh, it's the first studio I ever had in my life. And I had it for a couple of years. I shared it with a friend. And then it sort of evolved into a gallery. She moved out. I made it a real gallery. So I was there by myself for 14 years. And this is one of the paintings that came out of that, you know, partly because the building is so wonderful. Everybody loves the building and mm -hmm. the, the, the location on the water and the waterfall and the book mill. I mean, this, just everything that's there is, is just wonderful. And it's a red building. How can you not want to paint a red building? <laughs> <laughs> But you're, you're not in the main building. No, I'm in a... a actually Are you building, in that White House there? No, I'm actually... The building that I'm in isn't even in the picture, unfortunately. It doesn't show. It doesn't show from because this angle. Right behind, uh -huh. That's right. It's a smaller building with one end is brick. And we, the, the, uh, the new cooperative, Sawmill River Arts, which is now in our, our fifth year, we have the whole top of that smaller building, yes. which is just right next to the bookstore. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. it's wonderful. Yes, it's the book mill is in the, it, in the mill. In the main mill, right. And then there's a restaurant or two, and then there's something below you as well. Music, music yeah. and uh, DVDs. It's yeah. uh, Turn It Up. And turn It Up, right. Yep, yep. <coughs> yeah, and I love so that So where painting. were you sitting? When, where? I was sitting on the bridge. So the bridge that crosses the river before you turn left into the mill. That's the angle, and it's just a so great So this was angle. a plein air. It was mostly plein air, yeah. Yeah. Mostly plein air. Because yeah. you start up with plein air painting, most of us, unless you're really... Let me make clear. Plein air means full air. Right. Not plain air. Plein air. Full air, meaning you're outside right. painting. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're painting on site. So this is plein That's air. Right. Mm -hmm. And that one was from a photograph. Right. And this one is from your imagination. This right. one was from a photograph. Right. So there's a difference. That's, That's right. why I keep asking you if it's from a... a from this one was both, you said? That's right. The, right. the one with the uh, Texaco truck. Right. Yeah. Right. So and, and when you're doing plein air work, too, when you're painting outdoors, you really can only work for two or three hours. The light changes. You get tired. And then you bring the painting into the studio, and you decide what to finish, what to polish up, what to maybe change. What to add a green line What to, to add a green line, absolutely. Does it need a sky? You didn't have time to do the sky. You know, all those things you, you get to add when you're inside. How, how yeah. real is this? Is there oh, a it's fantasy? very real. No, it's very real. Mm -hmm. This one is pretty much as it was, uh, sort of a, a late October, early November day. So that was perfect. Not a lot of leaves that were inter, you know, interfering with the image. And, and, and I didn't really want all those green leaves with that red building. I wanted that red building. So uh -huh. I love it. So you forced yeah. the, the trees out of the picture. Well, you, they you died all by themselves. They dropped their leaves all by themselves. <laughs> well, there are, yes, I see. Okay. I didn't, <laughs> have, I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> you have something in your lap. Would you share what that sure, is? Sure, sure. <laughs> this is a fun thing. Um, when I went to Kenya in 90, gosh, I'm trying to think now, 91, um, <clears throat> I, went, I was there for almost a month. And when I was getting ready to go, a friend said to me, I think you should do a book. And I said, a book. And I thought about that and I thought, I've never done a book, I don't know, I don't know. But the whole time I was there, I thought about doing a book when I got back. So I bought this fabric there. This is Kenyan fabric. 
I bought it there, and then when I came home, I said, well, if I'm going to do a book, I better learn how to do books. So I took a bookbinding class to decide whether it was realistic for me to do this, and I decided it was. So I hand printed, and we'll have the grand uh, unveiling here. I hand printed 100 of these, and, uh, and I love it. I, I love it to pieces. Um, it has a storybook with it, and there are four stories about my experience with Kenyan women. And then the pictures. What is the, what is the method here? This is a small silkscreen press, a little Japanese silkscreen press. Not a squeegee, but a press. A press, and it actually would make multiples. So to make a book like this, 100 of them, and hand print them, you had to have some way to do multiples. So when you're doing a press, <coughs> let's take an image here, this elephant. elephant. Mm -hmm. How, is that done at once, or is that done in... One, two, three, four colors? No, it's all done at once, similar to the larger silk screens that I do, yeah. but the press is really little, and it takes, you, you put a lot of ink on the screen in the locations where you want the colors, and by pushing down the press, it pushes enough ink through each time to make a print. Does so it you, get lighter and lighter? It does. So you print, you can do about 25 before you need to re-ink it. So how do you number this if you number them? I just number it when the book was done. Uh -huh. So when I, once they were assembled, so I did it in three sections, so that if I screwed up, uh, I would only, I see. only so lose one I see. section. So, so the papers are glued together. That's right, they're glued together, and that was part of learning about bookbinding was you know how to glue things, and and I decided that an accordion book was the best answer for the book idea because then I could put the images all together, and it, it could be displayed on a mantle, on a piano, on a bookcase. Yeah. So I sold almost That's all of them. The grand finale is it paid for my trip. Oh, good. <laughs> oh, good. So if you make 100 books and you sell 90 of them, you can go to Africa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah, which is another reason that it's very precious. Very precious. And you have another one like that, too. I saved a several. My family, each members each have no, one. No, I mean a different topic. Oh, yes. Thank you. I made another one when I got home on the Connecticut River. And uh, it's not quite as colorful, it's a little more subtle, and it was a little different approach, but it was nice too. It was nice. Yeah. I think I only did about 25 of those. I, I forgot to ask you, besides those two educational things mm. that we looked at at the very beginning, you do other ones too, right? I do programs, yes. Okay. So I teach a lot. I do a lot of presentations and programs. Teach me about this. <laughs> oh, you're catching me off guard here. I don't know what to call this one. Okay, well. Mountains and valleys? Mountains and valleys. It's actually, for those people who love the West, these are the Aspens in the fall. And I go out west every year. My daughter lives in southern Colorado. My brother lives in Colorado. But I teach in New Mexico, which this is really a New Mexico landscape. People find that surprising, but there are a lot of mountains in New Mexico. This is northern New Mexico when the aspens are at their peak. So I did use a photograph for this from a ranch, and I found it in a you know, fancy brochure and stuff. And, uh, and I loved painting it. I just loved it. It's my latest hot off the easel painting and um, I'm in a gallery out in Taos, New Mexico so now that I'm very close up sure I see you use big brushes y you know not so huge an inch not gigantic Hips, but big. strong, strong, strong strokes. Stro strong strokes. When you come strokes. up close right. you can see these strong strokes that right. I can't see at a distance. Right. This is powerful. Yeah thank you. Well that's my goal is to have more structure, more uh, texture, bolder, and again, that idea of adding a color maybe where people won't expect it, and that's the gold on the mountains. So bringing that gold up through, and then the lavender, it's all outlined in lavender or purple, so the whole painting was designed that way, and a green sky. It's not very typical. Not typical. Not very typical. Not even there. Not even, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not even that. But so I this loved is, it on the painting. This is your latest piece. This is my latest, right. So this is, right. this is, is this what you're working on now? Well, that's why I said about the gallery in Taos. The gallery in Taos, I offered him something, a variation on this. So he likes tall, skinny paintings. So I said, let me take part of this painting and make it tall and skinny for you. And another part, make it tall and skinny. So oh. he has two larger, tall, skinny versions from this painting. And that's been really exciting. That's a new, new venture for me. Well, thank you for sharing your many adventures and ventures and, um, and sharing all about your work and your teaching and your travels and your experiments. And I, um, I thank you very much, Louise. Thanks, Jane. This has been delightful. Great fun.
thank you for being with us. This is Talking Art. We were interviewing and talking with Louise Minx. And we'll see you next week with another artist. Thank you. <laughs>